screen you see two books. One is Mind Creative Restoring Schools, Restorative Schools, and there's a flyer on your table if you'd like to take with you um, so that you know where to purchase the book if you're interested. And um, Living Justice Press has many, many, many resources on restorative justice. And another book I would invite you all to take a look at is Kay Pranis' little book of circle processes because it may be something that you can use and incorporate right here into the inter Interfaith Cafe. I'm gonna give you a little tiny dip into that water tonight, so don't get too comfortable at your tables. We will be asking you to move around a little bit when it comes time for the discussion. And I'll guide you through um, how to do your dialogue a little bit differently and restoratively. Part of restorative justice is redefining the word justice. And part of redefining justice is speaking truth. And so, Many of us in social justice movements around North America are starting at our presentations and conferences with a sacred acknowledgement of the land that we are on. Because we are on the stolen land once occupied by indigenous people of this country. So here we acknowledge the sacred land where we work, live, teach, and learn, and build community. This has been a site of human activity for 13,000 years. This land was the territory of the Tequesta people who stewarded the land for hundreds of generations and were forcibly removed from their land as a result of the genocidal policies of the American government which continue on today. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, worship, learn, and work here. My field is also now recognizing that restorative justice must also include the work of racial equity. So I want to set the context of this talk by acknowledging that mass incarceration of black and brown people in this country is not by accident, it is purely by design. And I will refer you to Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, for more detailed information on that. But mass incarceration of people of color is the direct result of structural racism upon which our country is built. Restorative justice seeks not only to redefine justice as we know it and how it's done in the world, but ultimately we seek to dismantle racism, inequity, and the prison industrial complex that prof profits from modern slavery, also known as mass incarceration. I'd also like for us to consider the words of Gandhi, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. I do this because so many people have found a way to justify violence, punishment, torture, war, mass incarceration, and the death penalty by saying, yeah, but eye for an eye is in the Bible. So I ask you to hold Gandhi's wisdom close because restorative <coughs> justice provides us with a counter narrative to that of vengeance and punishment and offers a way to repair harm, heal individuals and communities. How many of you caught any one of the eight episodes of Stan Jones' Redemption Project? A few of you. Good, it aired last spring. So Van Jones uh, has spent a long time in the criminal justice system as a prosecutor and I believe is also a defense attorney. He's very aware of the injustices and so he got real interested in restorative justice. But I was disappointed in this series because he never took time to explain what restorative justice really was. And there's a lot of myth and misinformation out there and I'm a little bit concerned that perhaps his series contributed to some of that misinformation because sometimes what was representative as restorative justice wasn't quite spot on. So I'm gonna spend some time helping you understand what it really is because RJ requires us to think really differently about harm, crime, and relationships. It starts with Howard Zare. In 1990, Professor Howard Zare wrote the seminal book called Changing Lenses. Howard is a Mennonite and is considered one of the founding fathers of the contemporary restorative justice movement. His work and teachings have now permeated all aspects of life and learning at Eastern Mennonite University, where he established the Zare Institute of Restorative Justice. Today, people of many faiths have taken up the cause of restorative justice as the values of peaceful conflict resolution love, humility, honesty, and empathy resonate with many religions and spiritualities. Howard Zare gave us the foundations for restorative justice, which he says requires a paradigm shift 
in how we look at crime and harm. Paradigm shift is a fundamental change in our approach or underlying assumptions. So for a couple of examples, when people found out the world was flat or was round instead of flat, that was an enormous paradigm shift. There were a lot of assumptions writing on the world was flat. When people found out the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around, there was another enormous paradigm shift about pe how people thought about the world and the universe. And the restorative paradigm shift is just about that big and earth shattering. The paradigm shift is that huge because we have been ingrained to believe that punishment is effective and a deterrent, and it is not. We believe that it's okay for the state and the police to solve our problems, and it's not. We think that harm is about broken rules and laws, and it's not. So I don't expect you to leave here today as true believers. I just want to plant some seeds and challenge perhaps your current mindset, give you some ideas and a process for handling conflict and harm differently, and maybe even having dialogues differently than you currently do. At the very heart of RJ is the belief that we are all interconnected. And this is a belief held for thousands of years by indigenous peoples all over the world. This is not a new idea. But Western ways of thinking, as well as many of our religions, have sought to destroy this concept and replace it with the myths that individuals are rocks. We are islands. We can do anything if we put our minds to it. It's called individualism and meritocracy. If you just work hard enough, you can succeed. And if you don't succeed, it's because you didn't work hard enough or there was something wrong with you. If you commit a crime, it's because you sinned or are evil not because of any mitigating circumstances that shaped your human development and influenced your actions. Restorative justice invites us to critically examine the myths of individualism and meritocracy because the scientific facts are our brains are hardwired for connection. Without connections to each other, we die. When we are disconnected from each other, we have the kind of problem we are seeing in the world today including when we disconnect ourselves from our environment. When babies are neglected, they die. We are intimately dependent on each other. And this means our well-being, our health, our survival, depends on us working together as a collective, not as individuals. Human beings are not designed to thrive in isolation. We are built to live in community. This is why people put into isolation in prisons, lose their minds. Restorative justice invites us to redefine and recreate community so that all community members are supported and thrive. And for those who are struggling, we help them. So the circle, whether you call it a peacemaking circle, a talking circle, a restorative circle, there's millions of different names for these circles. It's one of the main restorative processes and like RJ, it's grounded in values. So these values are often referred to as universal human values, the 10 things we all need to thrive and survive and live well together in community. And I wanna let you know, these are all available at livingjusticepress.org. Um, from their website, these kind of posters are part of their free downloadable resources. Restorative justice is a values-based philosophy and its practices are grounded in the very same values. And these values permeate every aspect of our work. So many of us have come to believe that restorative justice is a way of life, a way of being, not just something we do or practice. In fact, the journey to becoming a restorative person is for many, the work. And it's a lifetime of work. So you may notice that some, if not all, of these values are congruent with the values of your own faith. People from every faith and walk of life are called to restorative justice, and I believe it's because it is a values-based philosophy and practice. And it provides us a vehicle and a process for putting our values and our faith into action. So now, finally, let's try to define restorative justice and learn some of the big ideas. There is no standard definition of restorative justice. We know it's a problem. It's why we don't have an elevator speech. We're working on it. So I'm gonna do the best that I can for you. But keep in mind that 30 minutes only allows us to scratch the surface. I've been studying this for 10 years. I've read hundreds of books, thousands of articles. 
done a lot of research, um, and I'm still trying to make that paradigm shift. So um, later, I'm going to ask you, give you some questions to discuss to allow you to process this information and wrestle with these own ideas about changing your lenses about how you view harm and punishment. So I'll give you a second to read the definition. Restorative justice emphasizes repairing harm, healing people and communities, transforming lives and communities, not punishment. Because punishment does none of those things. So there's three foundational principles of restorative justice. And the first one is that crime causes harm. And justice should focus on repairing that harm. I'm going to give you a real life example of this in just a minute. Second principle is that the people most affected by the crime are the ones who should be part of the solution and the responsibility of government is to maintain order and of the community to build peace. So when I was living in Denver in the 1990s, parked my car out on the street. And one night I came, or one morning I came out to go to work and my window had been smashed. And this is back in the days when our cell phones were those big bag phones. Did anyone yeah. have those? I was a sales rep for a company and that phone was like the latest, greatest technology and it was my company's phone. So my window was smashed, company property was stolen, and I was livid. So I made the police report only to find out that this happened to about 15 other people within a one mile radius of my house. It was part of a kind of a little crime spree. So months later I get contacted by the Denver police that they had recovered the property. And the story is this, it was four or five boys riding around in a car that night, causing mischief. They broke into cars, they stole whatever was available. When they were finally caught with this carload full of people's possessions, they knew enough not to point the finger at who did what. So basically, nobody was going down for this crime because nobody could pinpoint any, act any actions to an individual. And honestly, I can't remember if I got my phone back or not, but it didn't matter because by then it was already replaced. So let's take a look at what happened there. There was harm done. Who was the harm done to? You, you, you. your company. Me, who else? Your company. My company, yes. Them. The community, yes, Ma. yes. All right, so there was a lot of people involved with this harm, right? So there was no justice done of any kind, the way law enforcement and, and the justice system handled had we had a restorative process, here's how this would have worked. The focus for those boys would have been repairing that harm done to individuals, done to the community, and done to the company. So what that might look like is paying us all back for what it cost us to have our windows repaired, right? But if they were poor, they would not have the financial means to do that, nor would they have the financial means to, to um, replace the phones, right? So when we think about repairing the harm, sometimes we have to get really super creative because sometimes it's not a direct repair, particularly in the instances of murder and violence and sexual assault. You cannot undo what's been done. That repair takes a different form, and that's why restorative justice is just so darn complex. What it could have looked like, though, is those of us in the community could have sat with those boys and let them know what it felt like to walk out and find that our car was broken into and our property was stolen. And what it felt like then to find out that it happened through the entire neighborhood. Because now there's a ripple of fear in this neighborhood where everybody was thinking they were safe and now nobody's feeling like they're safe. And we're locking our doors at night and we're neighborhood watching. And we're doing all the things that happen in a community after a little crime spree like that. Typically then, we would work with those boys to figure out how they can repair that. And let's assume they were poor without the financial means to make direct reparations of the property. We might then figure out how we could work with them side by side to do something good in that very community. Perhaps there was an elderly person who didn't have the means to repair the fence. Perhaps this means building a community garden. Perhaps this means mowing lawns, whatever it is, whatever 
the, the victims of this crime decide they need to feel safe again. And through that act of harm reparation, that's where the transformation happens. That's where people can heal, because the likelihood, if we were able to restore that, the, that situation with the boys, the likelihood of them ever coming back drops to next to nothing, and maybe the likelihood of them ever doing that again to anybody else also decreases. Because now it went from being just stuff in strangers' cars to being a real life connected situation with people. So there is one of the myths about restorative justice is that restorative justice is soft because we talk about reparation instead of punishment. But how many of you have ever had to sit across from somebody that you love and that you hurt and say, I'm sorry, how can I fix this? <laughs> okay, you know how hard it is. We would rather be right than say, I'm sorry. So many of us are like that. This is hard. Now, it may not involve prison, it may not involve punishment, but it involves intense emotional work and soul work and heart work to come to terms and own the harm that you committed and how it affected other people. And you can't help but be transformed by that. So again, the big idea is we repair harm through an encounter. Now some of these encounters are done with surrogates. There's a lot of restorative justice done in prisons, um, let's say with sexual assault, where a survivor of a sexual assault that has nothing to do with the men in the prison is able to come in and have these conversations of impact and effect with men. So surrogate victims are also um, part of this process a lot. And then the third part is the transformation. So again, our four big components, I'm hoping now you can start to see how this is so incredibly different. That we start with this really firm foundation that all people are worthy and relational. Right there is where our work begins. Because we are socialized in a very racist society where we do not believe that all people are worthy and relational. We have bias, we have internal bias, we have prejudices that we are aware we don't think that everybody is worthy, and we certainly don't think that they're equal. So if you want to know where the work begins, it starts right there with understanding this. All humans are worthy. We are relational. Then after the harm has been committed, it's about inclusion. Bringing as many people, we call them stakeholders, as many people to the process as possible. That may include supporters of the victim, supporters of the offenders, it can include family, it can include community, how, whatever it is the nature of the harm is. The nature of the process, so everybody is supportive, because the work of moving into harm reparation is going to be difficult. Through that encounter, there are efforts then to figure out how things can be made right. Now this is where the voice of the victim comes in, all through the process. Go right to criminal justice, right? Anybody been a victim of a crime? White collar, nonviolent, violent, anything? Be honest. We've all been victims, right? Okay? We're not allowed in the courtroom if it even gets that far. We're not involved in the decision to plead it out. The only time we're allowed into the process is after we file the report and then again if we make a um, witness statement, a victim statement at sentencing. The state steals our conflict which is why there's so little satisfaction with the justice process, because when does the victim get to be satisfied? When does the victim get to say what he or she needs in order to heal and make things right? Never. So this encounter, this idea of making things right, is really the revolutionary and transformational aspect of restorative justice. The final step then is reintegration. Welcoming back into that community in some way, shape, or form. And many times, this takes the shape of, through these processes and connections, that people who are involved in the harm end up literally becoming mentors, guides, friends with the offender. And if that doesn't happen, they are certainly kept apprised of status all along the way. There are formal agreements that are made. Part of the making things right is an agreement. In most studies, when these agreements are done, Victims report a much higher rate of satisfaction than in the criminal justice system. 
and about 80% or more of the um, rep reparative agreements are fulfilled. So let's take one last look at this comparison. Crime is a violation of people and relationships, not broken laws. When you create that harm, you've now created an obligation to make it right. And you do that by involving all the stakeholders and the victim's voice, who is the one who drives the train on what is needed to make things right. The focus is on the victim and offender responsibility for repairing harm. So if you want to substitute some of those words that we throw around in lieu of punishment, one of them being consequences. Like the consequences making things right. Sometimes that consequence is also going to prison. The consequence is the accountability is on that harm reparation. Sometimes in the instance of violent crimes, a restorative process called a victim offender mediation or victim offender dialogue takes place where the person is sent to prison or to jail. And at that point, a facilitator, a very highly trained facilitator, organizes a victim offender mediation, if both parties agree to it, where they can have that encounter and talk about it. So I'll give you a story of um, some guys I met in prison in England when I was visiting over there. And they had had a surrogate victim come in and share his story uh, with about eight men in prison. Now, the victim's story was that he had been burglarized. Somebody broke in his house, stole his TV. What he told the inmates was the impact of that burglary. It wasn't the TV. It was the anxiety disorder he dis developed as a result of that. It was the feeling that he could not ever feel safe in his home again. It was the insomnia that he developed as a result of that burglary of a television set. So this guy said to me, he was telling me the story, and he said, after I heard his story, I promise myself, when I get out of here, I'm not doing that again. Because before it was just a TV and I knew he had the money to replace it. It was, I was just stealing stuff. He says, now I know how much pain I caused him and I don't ever want to hurt anybody like that again. That's how powerful this is. You might be curious as to why this is all over the world and why we know so much about it and we don't see it here in Florida. So I'm going to point you to what I believe is the source of that problem, and that's just five miles from here, sitting at the corner of Yamato and I-95 in that big shiny building with the words GEO on top of it. GEO is the second largest private security company in the world, which means they own, build, and develop private prisons. They are a multi-billion dollar company with enormous influence, both in terms of lobbying, influencing judges, influencing legislatures, and influencing policy. So I could go off on this here. But again, I'm going to invite you to read more. Read the work of Angela Davis. Read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. The rise of the private prison industrial complex started as a backlash against the civil rights. It was initiated by President Richard Nixon. It was put into gear under President Ronald Reagan, and it was accelerated almost to its maximum under Bill Clinton. There are no party lines associated with the power of this corporation. Follow the money. It starts at I-95 in Yamato, and those tentacles and those webs reach everywhere, including school boards because it is against their business model to plug and dismantle the school to prison pip pipeline. It is against their business model to support restorative justice, drug courts, or any other diversionary programs that keep people out of those prisons because that's where they make their money. It is modern day slavery. As people of faith, I call upon you to fight against this evil because it is immoral and unethical to profit from warehousing human beings. And the majority of people in these prisons are black and brown people, and they are exploited for free and obscenely cheap labor. This is documented. This is not opinion. And this is why California, as the leader of this country, has passed legislation to outlaw private prisons. I'm praying that the other 49 <laughs> I don't know if you'll see
see it happen here in Florida because they're sitting right down the street from us. There is a reason why that one of the first actions Rick Scott took as governor was to try to single-handedly hand over 50% of the prisons in Florida, where the, we are the third largest in the country, 50% of that system right into the hands of GeoCorp. Mm. And the court shut that move down. Follow the money. That's why you're not seeing it here. But gosh darn, we're trying. <laughs> so I just want to talk a little bit more about the area that I'm very much involved in, and that's restorative justice and education, because it looks very different than restorative justice in the outside world. The biggest reason for this is because RJE, we believe, doesn't start after a harm has occurred like it does in the outside world. It is actually a way of doing school. Again, at the heart of it, people are worthy and relational. They're not their test score. And then we have the three pillars of restorative justice and education, which are building and nurturing relationships creating just and equitable learning environments, repairing harm and transforming conflict. And this is all surrounded by those values of respect, dignity, and mutual concern. RJE facilitates learning communities that nurture the capacity of people to engage with one another and their environment in a manner that supports and respects the inherent dignity and worth of all people. So before I move away from this, I invite you to read the book if you want to know about more about RJE, but I'll tell you about my one conversation I had with a school board member here um, just about a year ago, shortly after the Parkland shootings. The state, all of a sudden, found enormous amounts of money, and I kind of wonder where it came from, to put armed police officers in every elementary school in Palm Beach County. Right. Now, right. there's not a stitch of research that shows they make the school safer. In fact, they do one thing and they criminalize behavior. They know how to arrest kids. So I sat at the table from a school board member and I said, please, the vote is Wednesday to accept that money. And it was a lot of money. I said, please read the first two chapters of my book and vote against this and instead propose unarmed resource officers changed in, trained in conflict resolution and human development and conflict de-escalation and we use the rest of the money to start training people in restorative justice and education. And he used to say, I never heard from that school board member again. Mm -hmm. One thing we do hear about in schools here is social emotional learning. Like Palm Beach County schools are doing social emotional learning. The cool thing about restorative justice and education is that the restorative processes build social emotional capacities. You really don't need to spend money on a separate curriculum because when you sit in circle or when you have restorative conversations and we have restorative conferences, you are already building those capacities. They go hand in hand. The circle, for instance, helps students and adults develop their ability to be self-aware, make responsible decisions, build relationships, be aware of the feelings of others and, and build empathy and the ability to manage one's own emotions and behaviors. These are all life skills. So restorative justice and education implemented not as a response to behavior, not as a way to fix kids who aren't complying with the rules, but as a way to shift school culture, to go across all school environments with a focus on relationships first, has the ability to develop people's, adults and students, social emotional learning capacities, and really transform schools. Create that community, that sense of belonging. I do have just a minute, and I'm gonna just, this is a little bit controversial, but I'm gonna throw it out there, because when I heard the story of Nicholas Cruz, the shooter at Parkland, I looked deeper into his story. And the kid had a hard life. He was carrying around unhealed trauma. He had some mental health issues. At no point was he getting any help that he needed. The only person on the planet that he was connected to was his mother. Three months before the shooting, she died. That was his trigger. He lost his one and only connection to another human being on this planet. And we all know what happened next. Now my argument, and it's not just me, if that school 
And if all schools were restored, he wouldn't have slipped through those cracks. People would have been working with him. He would have been in relationship. He would have been in circle. He would have been connecting. There would have been somebody, even just one person, that even if Nicholas didn't go to him, that adult would have gone, the adult would have gone to Nick. Because that's what happens when you create a caring community, when you build and nurture those relationships. When you develop that sense of community, when somebody in the community is hurting and needs support, you start circling up and you start figuring out how we can support this struggling kid. And that's why, for nothing else, to plug the school to prison pipeline and to put an end to the insanity of these school shootings, we need to get serious about how, how we're doing education and how we're doing criminal justice. Because, in the words of Einstein, insanity is the definition of doing the same thing over and over and expecting results, and we are deep in insanity in this country. So in just a few minutes, I'm gonna invite you to circle up and have your discussion in a circle, and I'll facilitate how um, how I'd like you to try this tonight. But in the meantime, um, Linda, how much time do we have for questions? Uh, Couple of 10, 15 minutes. All right, does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I really love. Hi, I, I thought you mentioned that this is more common in other countries. Can you give us examples of how restorative justice is being applied in other countries? New Zealand, Australia, United Kingdom, um, Canada are the big ones. It is in the United States. It's applied in the juvenile justice systems. It's in the schools. It's in the criminal justice system. Um, Oakland School District in California is where I did my research. Chicago, state of Minnesota, Wisconsin, New York, Pennsylvania. Um, it's cropping up in North Carolina. Texas schools are being trained, believe it or not, in restorative justice. I won't say they're necessarily being trained the right way, but they're getting, they're getting something. We won't put that piece on the internet. But, um, and, and it looks different. For example, we in North America, we, we put a lot of weight on the circle. That's like our main process. But in New Zealand and Australia they, and, and the UK, actually, they prefer the conferencing model. They're all very similar. Um, they're all grounded in the same values. The questions they ask are very different. Or, or very, very much, uh, very similar across across the board. So, in my research, sorry, but uh, um, there's 30 years of research across uh, Scotland as well, all all across the United Kingdom. There's 30 years of research from all around the globe on restorative justice in the criminal justice system, juvenile justice, and in schools. So we we have plenty of examples where you're seeing that this is working. Tons. Yes. There's not one single one. There's there's a lot of them. There's just a lot. And a good place to start is at Living Justice Press. Um, and search Amazon for books on restorative justice. Now I will say, because of what we're up against here in the United States in the criminal justice system, which you see is going more and more and more and more punitive every day, I keep saying, there are so many nails in the lid of that coffin. How could, we're now pounding nails through the nails. But where this is grabbing hold is in the schools. So there's a lot more um, books and studies and research recently in the United States um, in, the, in the school end of things. But there's lots of, um, Baltimore has a community justice, uh, restorative youth, restorative justice for Oakland youth. There's, there's uh, the Chicago youth. There's different community-based organizations that are working with kids all over the country. And the Judge Alvarez came to us a while ago and spoke about, spoke about the criminal system. And he talked about youth being tried as adults and how they can change that. And he, he started a system where they can be, uh, he, well, what he said is if the youth is treated with the family and its surroundings, Mm -hmm. 
And the research um, shows the recidivism rates coming out of private prisons are not less than public prisons. They are the same, if not worse. Again, because they, they're not getting, there's no incentive to provide them with any programs. So just to boil it down to dollars and cents, it costs, if you have a high needs kid, and I'm talking a kid who needs a lot of services and a lot of support. If you have a high needs kid, it costs about $10,000 a year to educate that kid with the social worker, with the counselor, with the wraparound services that they need. And, and 10 is a little high. We don't spend anywhere near that in Florida. Florida costs 55,000 a year to put them in the juvenile justice system. And the reason why that's so expensive is because when they're in juvie, they have to, by law, get the social worker, education, teachers. There's all these services that they have to get as juveniles that they didn't get in the school. So, those, so instead of spending 10, they'll spend 55 per kid in juvie. And then when they get to the prison system, because your odds um, of when you're in juvenile justice of going into criminal justice are about 60% likelihood. Then you're looking at $35,000 a year in Florida prisons, and that number jumps to 80,000 when you get to California prisons. And only 6% of Florida inmates get the mental health, substance abuse, and educational services they need so that they don't go out and commit crimes again. Six percent. The system is incredibly broken. And we know with this work, we're shoveling a lot of sand against a big rising tide. But what else are we gonna do? And I call upon you as people of faith, really, look at what's happening and just ask yourself, is this right? was here also and he talked about fund safety and one of the things that 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 part of money that uh, was provided to the schools was to provide locked doors for the classrooms and he said that wasn't effective either he, someone said one of your kids could be outside how can we use this technique personally in personal relationships you have to study it a whole lot more than this we're not going to get close to being able to do that um, in this 30 minute talk. I'm sorry, Linda. Mm -hmm. But the Little Book of Circle Processes costs five bucks. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it is a how to. It can kind of lead you through those, those processes. So, one of the interesting things, I criticize Florida a lot, and I feel like it's entirely 100% justified, um, is the lack of evidence based policy making that is done here in the state. There is no research that shows um, that, that armed cops and armed teachers create a safer school, none. There is an entire field of research that shows the detrimental effects that creating a school that looks and acts like a prison does on kids. Okay, so when they have to pass through a sally port, when they're passing through lock gates, when they're passing through metal detectors, when there's cameras everywhere, and basically these are the technologies of the criminal justice system. When they're put in schools, then how does the kid feel? They feel like a criminal, right? They feel like they're being watched, like they're not trusted, like they're not valued. And our schools do a great job of teaching kids how to walk in a single file line and don't talk from the classroom to the cafeteria, just like you have to do when you're in prison. Read Angela Davis's work on this about how good our schools are doing at socializing kids for the prison environment right now. It really is this big. But the good news is we have solutions. We just need policymakers to do what we always need them to do, right? Have the courage, have the political will to do things differently and to actually look at the research and step out and try something new that is evidence-based and that we do have research for and that we can show a track record for and something that is based on real life and research and effectiveness in, and not fear. Restorative justice doesn't play the fear game. Any other questions?
question is how does the prisoner get enough time to, to deal with the emotions? So restorative processes are voluntary. So um, they don't just manifest and they're not done quickly. There's an intense amount of preparation done with the offender, with the victim. Everybody knows what to expect. Um, when did they go into that room and they're there because they've agreed to be and they, they want to be. Um, so part of that, as well as there's support for both the victim, there's support for the offender. There's, it's a complicated process and it's very individualized. Um, I'll give you an example. In Minnesota, there is a whole group of people who do victim offender dialogues. They are, they are working with the Department of Corrections. They're in the prisons. This, this is made available as an option. It's made available as an option to victims as well, which they can choose to opt in or, or opt out of. And that's something we struggle in the school conversation because it does need to be voluntary. So top-down mandates, we're not for that. We're not for particularly not for top-down unfunded mandates, which is typically how educational mandates come. We want you to do this now, and they don't give you any money to do it. Uh, this is a paradigm shift. This is really changing how we operate in the world. And so people have to be willing to come to it. So that means if you've got a group of teachers who are holding out and they don't want to be involved, like they have that right to do that. But a lot of times, seeing is believing, and when they start to see kids acting differently, they start to wonder why all the kids are going into that teacher's room, and why that teacher never sends any kid out of the classroom anymore. They start to see things are changing, and can tend to come along at that point. Yes, sir. Um, I remember uh, Angela Davis as a political prisoner in our country during the Vietnam era. Uh, where is she now, or, uh, and which works of hers would you recommend that I read? I have several of her books. Um, there's one about freedom, uh, Dialogues of Freedom or something like that, that is a collection of her speeches that she makes around the country. I really like that one, but just look up her works. Angela Davis um, is based in Santa Cruz. She's going all around the world. She is still very much an activist and a, and a hero of mine. Her sister, Fania Davis, who was part of the legal team during her incarceration, uh, founded restorative Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, and Fania is a leading, now international advocate of restorative justice all around the world. So Angela's work will also take you into the topic of prison abolition, which is a big gray area, um, but that again, that is based on its use as a form of slavery and not as a, as a form of punishment, so that's interesting to read out as well. Thank you very much. And just to, just to give you an idea of how big it goes. I mean, when we talk about restorative justice, a lot of times we're talking about that those individual encounters. In the schools, we're talking about it as a community. But Nelson Mandela's work with Bishop Desmond Tutu was restorative justice on a grand scale. Same values, similar processes, people coming together to speak their truth and be heard, which is what restorative justice is really all about. So truth and reconciliation, Commission in South Africa, the one that, in, that was passed in Canada, and the work being done in Maine to reconcile um, with settler colonizers and indigenous populations are really all based on restorative justice processes and principles. Because ultimately, they came from indigenous people. They very much belong to indigenous people. So it's as big as we want to take it. Mark Umbright, um, who just retired from University of Minnesota, I believe. He does a lot with Victor Offender, Offender Dialogues. And he's been going to Palestine and Israel for years and years and years and doing peace building work with using restorative practices over there between people who have been harmed um, by the ongoing conflict. So it's as big and as deep as we want to take it. Good news today, Netanyahu was indicted. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd like to do now, if it's okay? All right, let's do this. I'll try to teach you a little bit about the restorative circle process. And this is, um, I'm just gonna ask the two folks in the back to, to join a table and ask you to sit around um, a table. Do you wanna move people or can people just stay where they are? Okay. 
So the circle process is something, again, that comes from indigenous peoples. If every single one of us went back far enough in our own ancestry, our ancestors sat in circles some way. I really resonate with my Celtic ancestors. We sat in a circle, and we've got Stonehenge to prove that circles were very much part of our, of our ancient culture, as it was for many people. And what the circle does, first of all, is it creates an equal relationship. Nobody's above anyone else. There's no beginning or end. Not at a conference table. There's no leader. There's usually a circle keeper. And tonight, you may not really have one of those, because this is a quick dip into it. But some, in addition to the values that we looked at earlier that are embodied in the circle process, the notion also is deeply embedded in the indigenous, in many indigenous traditions of the medicine wheel, where we're bringing our whole self. So if we really wanted to do circle a little bit deeper tonight, I would ask you to move your chairs and get away from the table, because that table right there is, is still a barrier between you all. So if your table wants to move and really circle up, I invite you to do that. That's, I'm going to let that be your choice. The idea when we sit in circle without these barriers is we are full frontal. There's, there's an intense sense of vulnerability, and I'm not sure you'll get to that under the protection of that table. As we sit in circle with each other, our heart energy is all pointed towards the center of the circle, and that in and of itself creates an energy that holds the space as well. And I think this is what we refer to as the magic of the circle, because something happens when people circle up. It just does. I'll be curious to find out at the end of the night if you felt any, um, anything different tonight after you've done circle this way than you would in your regular dialogue. So the idea here is that your whole self, mind, body, spirit, and heart, is welcome. You know, you're a group of smart people, so it's not just about your heads. It's not just about your faith. It's about everything your whole self, that's welcome. So how the process works is we're gonna ask you to use something on your table that you can hold as a talking piece. A set of keys, a phone, a pen, whatever, whatever's gonna work for you. The talking piece, decide who's gonna kind of start. The talking piece is passed in the order around the table, not across, not to different people, in order. When it comes to you, the person holding the talking piece has the right to speak, and everyone else listens. There's no cross dialogue. There's no commenting on what that person said. When you're done speaking from your heart, you pass the piece to the person to the left. So there's an incredible sense of empowerment when, when you hold the piece, whatever it is, because it means you can do two things. You can speak your truth with those values of honesty and vulnerability, where you can choose to pass. You don't have to speak, which is equally as empowering. So you can already see those social emotional connections between giving people these kinds of choices. So when the circle is, when the talking piece is being passed, we just ask that you speak from the heart and listen from the heart. Speak with respect and listen with respect. Remain in the circle. And that last value of honoring the confidentiality is kind of a practice that we have. What is said is circle stays in circle. If you want to go home tonight and tell somebody about this circle experience, you're welcome to speak about your experience, but not anybody else's. You can talk about what you said if you are so inclined, but not what other people said. Okay? So feel free to... Um, to create that space. So at this point, I'm gonna ask you to think broadly about this. Decide at your table who's gonna start. So just remember to just go in order. Respect the talking piece, which means if you have something to say, you just wait until it comes to you. And in the meantime, you're listening to other people talk. And think about this. Here's some other questions if you wanna go deeper, because you've got a lot of time, so you can do several rounds of, of the dialogue, if you'd like. Do the teachings of your faith leave room for the shifting possibility from punitive to restorative? 
What teachings support it? What might hinder that? Coming back to the eye for an eye, for instance. So I'm gonna turn this over to you, and I think, Linda, can we can we do kind of a report out? At 8.30? Yeah, let's, let's bring the group back together. I would like to just get some feedback from you on what the experience was like, what you learned, maybe what you felt, if, you, if anybody would like to share out before we um, break for the evening. So enjoy circle.